Alice. School-supported agriculture, a systemic intervention, I think. I wonder what inspired this vision? What lit the fire under you to begin with? Where did this idea come from in you? Well, I have a very short story to tell, and maybe you know this already. Um, but I was called from uh, uh, by a woman who ran a garden program in the San Francisco County Jail. And she called me to ask me if I would buy vegetables from her uh, if, uh, if they grew them to my specifications. And I said, of course I would. And I went, um, I, I said, would you please deliver them? And she said, no, you have to come to the jail. And I was sort of shamed into going. And she brought a whole group of men around to talk to me about their seven-acre garden that they had at the jail. And, and one guy, she said, tell Alice what's happened, happening here. And he raised his hand and he said, this is um, my first day in the garden, and I shouldn't say anything, but it's the best day of my life. And I knew right then that gardens could be really therapeutic and empowering. And I said, my God, if you can do it in a jail, maybe you could do it in a school. And that really inspired the Edible Schoolyard Project in Berkeley. So you talk about, it's really interesting, we have 15 seconds for this interview. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what inspired, like you talk about s school lunch as an academic subject and working food into the curriculum in schools. Well, let's, before we even go there, this, why don't you describe what we're looking at here? Now, this is the garden uh, be, uh, in, that we work in at the Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School. And some of the students, but you can see uh, this wonderful quote from Martin Luther King. And I really believe that the time is always right to do what is right. And we are right in that moment. So food has worked its way. You, you could talk about school lunch as an academic subject. Why don't we just start there? Well, I, I know you're all familiar, or maybe you're not, with the fast food free-for-all that happens in the United States, particularly for lunchtime. It's, uh, you know, you're standing in line, no place to sit, you're grabbing food and, and eating it in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and so I thought the way to get, bring dignity to uh, food and a, a way to really engage the students would be to connect the food with what they're studying in school. And let's say they were studying the civilizations of the Americas. Or maybe it's a language class, which I'm showing you here. And these would be the placemats. Oh, uh, is it India? <laughs> I, just, I was just <laughs> giving Lane to see a couple. Or it could be India, or it could be. But you might be eating a tortilla soup, all together seated at the table. And you might be speaking a language like Spanish while you were eating the soup. Or let's say it's, uh, you're, you're studying the Silk Road in India. And uh, these are just some placemats that we uh, developed to connect academia, academia to food. And I, they have really worked like a charm for the students. And we put them down and, and we serve like a vegetarian curry, or we serve uh, uh, some raita and some 
poppadoms, but they, they learn about the cultures of the food of the world through food. And it's very important, this, as we are a global community. And it's just, I, I didn't think, and truly, I thought there would be resistance from the kids. But once they're empowered in a kitchen classroom where they're learning history of the Silk Road, and, but they're cooking at the same time, they learn about the food, they taste it, they're seasoning it themselves. So when they go into the cafeteria, they recognize it as their own. And it's really amazing how they like the really peasant, nutritious, affordable foods from most every culture. Really, um, it's, it's, these are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders that we've been working with. I keep thinking this um, in the course of this conference, and it's something that you often say, I wanna, Alice always says, I wanna feed you an idea. And I think Alex, that's, uh, it, from the minute I started eating Alex's food and being here at Fruto, and hearing everyone who's produced Fruto, every time we go to have a break or go to have a meal, someone is feeding us an idea, and ideas enter you in such a different way when food is part of it. I wonder, did you already know that before you, well, just back up for one more second and tell them why Martin Luther King Middle School, how that came to be the epicenter of the vision. Uh, I was being interviewed uh, one time uh, by this journalist in, in Berkeley, and um, he started asking me questions about the program uh, about public education. And it just came to me, how could a school look like the school at Martin Luther King that I walk by every day on my way to Chez Panisse? How could it look so abandoned and run down? How could there be graffiti on the malls and, and fences around the whole school? It was just pushing you away. And I made a comment like that. How could we in Berkeley, California, with the great university there, not pay attention to what was happening in our public schools? And so, very fortuitously, the principal, Neil Smith, <laughs> called me up and he said, hey, can you help us? And I think he was thinking I was just going to come over and beautify the front lawn of the school. But I had the whole vision walking around the school. I, I was a Montessori teacher, so I know that we need to have interactive education. It's the best way to learn. I knew this, and I know that we are, in the United States and probably around the world, sensorily deprived. We, we are really not touching, we're not tasting, we're not smelling, we're not holding each other's hands. I love to come to Brazil because I, I get to hold hands and, <laughs> and, and kiss people. And, <laughs> And it's, I, I can't tell you, it feels so good to have that uh, happen. And we don't do that anymore. I mean, not that we ever did, <laughs> but we really don't do that. And so this was a way of, of I just thought, an interactive education. So I married um, Montessori with the edible education. And we came up with this idea, but I always thought that the centerpiece would be the cafeteria. And that, of course, we would develop a network of suppliers just like we had done at Chez Panisse. And everyone would sit down and every day the values would wash over the children as they ate their meals together. 
And then you added, at what point did the addition of the school-supported agriculture, when did farmers find their way into this equation? Well, this kind of happened uh, a, a couple of years ago. I just realized that gardens in schools are great. And building that network of gardens and kitchen classrooms is important. But then I went to a conference about climate change. And it woke me up. I mean, really woke me up when I understood that making compost could really bring the carbon down from the air into the earth and that we could do something every day that was so addressing climate change and we could do this globally. So that made me think that, that this idea of feeding all children for free could actually come into being, especially in uh, the People's Republic of Berkeley and possibly in our state of California because we have an enlightened new governor, we have enlightened people in the government right now as our senators and congresspeople, we have a great person who's the superintendent of schools. And I think I'm going to invite you all to help us make this come to pass. But if, we, if they can have a free school lunch in New York City, which they do now, we could make a meal like this one. We could make a beautiful carrot soup with spices, a pita bread, hummus, affordably and deliciously for every child. It addresses the health of the children and the health of the soil simultaneously. And where's our farmer to come on stage? Ron, where are you? <laughs> so if I never like to come on sta a stage without having a farmer. Without I an always, apple and I a have farmer. A farmer. And I always have a child. <laughs> and an apple. <laughs> an apple and a friend. It's all you need in life. <laughs> Good. Just, but this is the reason that I know so many farmers. I'm a cheerleader for farmers. I'm a, I, I, I can't tell you, Chez Panisse would not be Chez Panisse without these people growing this nutritious food for us. I'm so grateful I couldn't do that work and I am, what can I say? Well, what you can say is... <laughs> <laughs> He'll tell you. I mean, it's, she's growing people, you know, it's not like growing food and she talks about values. So what you, what's happening is we're showing these children values and when you go to um, the edible schoolyard, Martin Luther King, which I've been there many times. You see these kids making this. You look at these guys' faces, man. And, and I remember one time I was there, and we were going to eat at some shishi ass restaurant, and I wanted to eat with the kids after smelling their cornbread and shit. I'm like, I don't want to, you know. So I mean, but you're teaching them life skills. You're teaching them that they have a value, and that's what we. That's what these kids don't get. When when I talk to kids, children, humans. You know, everything around them has value. The one thing that doesn't have value is them. They don't see themselves as having a value. And I have to, you are the most precious, expensive, valuable thing on this planet. And that's what we have to tell these kids. It's not a pair of Jordans. It's not no damn diamonds. It's not money, you know, and um, that's where we need to do. And that's, this is how you start that. You know, you're giving these kids a life skill, which also can, can turn into a career and a passion. And that's what, the, that's what the Edible Schoolyard does. But you're also, what we're doing is we're putting, maybe it's just a little flower from the garden on the table. So when they come in, they just know that they're cared for. And with so many kids not, um, you know, eating with their families and both parents working 
and they're, they're getting fast food, and it's just open in packages and piled on the table. And it's so beautiful to give them beauty and care. Beauty is a big piece of this. I mean, beauty, pleasure. I can't, I mean, when people see this kitchen classroom that we have, their response is always to, ah, it looks so beautiful to in here. To want to move in. You know? But I think what people re need to realize, just like ugly, beauty is by design. You know, it's purposeful. And what we also need to realize is that there's a lot of people making billions of dollars off of misery, off of homelessness, off of, off of people losing their houses, all of, off of poverty. We don't see it like that, but there's million, billions of dollars being made. And we, so we have to understand that all of this is by design. Cities are by design. They're not people-centric. Cities are not designed for people. They're designed for commerce, period. So we can change that being the designers that we are. We have just a minute, maybe we can squeak out to Alice. What do you want to say? Let's say 10 people in this audience are thinking, I'm going to go home and school supported agriculture is a vision I'm going to take with me and I'm going to attempt to implement it. Piece of advice, a little something to have in the back of the head. Well, the first thing that came to mind was invite the powers that be to your table, cook for them bring food. I never go any place without a basket of Kishu mandarin oranges at this time of year. And I just put it down on the table. I even send it to politicians who are in very cold places like Washington, D.C. And they get a box of Kishu mandarins. And they know that I'm, I'm there wanting to talk to them about about free school lunch. They know, they remember, because they eat those delicious fruits. But we have the power, I hate to wor use the word, to seduce. But it's really that, because it's so, some, when something is so tasty, you, you want to come back for more. And so I invited many of the teachers from the schools to come to Chez Panisse to have a meal with me to just talk about how we might implement it or the, the mayor of the city. And right now I'm about to go to um, uh, Sacramento and California with our new mayor and cook a school lunch with a, pl with a placemat for the politicians because Feeding them this idea is the best way to uh, have it digested. Yeah, what we need to realize, too, that is that we are the people in power. You know what I'm saying? It's not these minions that we voted for. I mean, we are, they're supposed to work for us. You know, we are the people in power. And, um, and that's what I, that, uh, that's, I think, with the changing the, the values of what these kids get, that's empowering them, you know? You said it in your speech. It started with one school. There are now how many? Well, there are 6,500 on our website of right now. These are around the world. And it's not a group of people that, that we called on to become part of this. This, turn the other side because it's even more impressive on the other side. These are a group of people that share our values. And uh, this is what scaling is all about. I hate that word. That's but, what power is all about. Yeah, they, everybody wants to know, all the people that we ask for money, well, how can this idea be scaled? <laughs> that's the first question that's asked. And I pull out this this um, network, and I say, <laughs> it's the ideas that are compelling, and the people feel the human values that people feel around the world, and they connect with that, and they want to be part of it. And so this is a valuable tool for implementing this idea from 
preschool all the way through the university. And I hope that every project that you all know about can be put into this network because I think it's going to be really instructive. Uh, Bella and many of the Fruto team are going to be passing out postcards that are in English, in Spanish, and in Portuguese. That, do you want to explain this as our last? Well, I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, I wonder, we wonder though, if, it, if it's just too late to ask if anybody has a question here. Yeah. A burning question. A burning question <laughs> that is a question. That was a complaint. I, is that people were waiting to ask these brilliant speakers questions, and it's like, okay, next. <laughs> okay. Do we have a start. perfect question? I mean, burning if question? there's something, if there's something that, that you need to know. Well, beautiful. Okay, maybe Thank we you. bring. But you were supposed to give them marching orders of what they're going to do when they leave. What? When? what they're supposed to do when they leave here. Now, well, uh, you know what my marching orders okay. are. They you gotta plant some shit. <laughs> you gotta give them yours. I think that's part of Alice's agenda but, as well. But I, I have this huge desire to do a project together and where everybody puts in his or her piece of it. That we create something that's greater than the sum of the parts. And I have been involved with a number of projects uh, during the course of these uh, 47 years, and they're never projects that I directed. They are projects that, that, that were collaborations. Like Cheeto and Lars. And I didn't even know what other people were doing, and we made the most, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, it's just surprising and important events. So we're coming up on the 50th birthday of Chez Panis. So maybe we need to. Why don't you just even tell them what you've been thinking about for the well. 50th, the, the, <laughs> the vision of the day? Well, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether it needs to be a walk from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Maybe we need to have people fed all along the way. Maybe we have to go. I don't know. Maybe we need to. We need to gather in a very fertile, hospitable place. Um, do you have any ideas, Ron? Well, well next year, what I want to do with fruit. So I want to take this shit to the street. <laughs> okay, because everybody here, we're preaching to the choir. All y'all know this shit we're talking about. You know, so what I want to do is at least one day, we set up in a plaza, and whoever wants to hear, whoever wants to spill to hear this gossip that we're spitting, that, that's what we should let happen. You know, at least one day. <laughs> Let's build something. It, ju it just occurred to me, I've always wanted to use that that power of people to do something significant and long-lasting. I feel like we gather at Terra Madre for slow food. And there are thousands of people there. Why don't, what, could we come here and plant trees in the rainforest? <laughs> I mean, I, we need to do something. We need to be the change we want to make in the world. We need to demonstrate that. Well, I'm, I'm impressed because there's people here at the conference that have told me they've been inspired. They started gardens and roof gardens because they were inspired by just hearing me. And I mean, with that energy, we need to, we just need to impregnate that some more, you know, and have some more and have some more babies and, and make this happen. And that, that's what I, that's what I see. I mean, the fact that I can be in the South Central and I got, I'm inspiring people in Sao Paulo and around, I mean, like, who expects to be known in, in a, you know, in a rainforest? Oh, we know who you are. I'm like, how? So no, I mean, and, and, and I don't take, I don't take that lightly at all. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm very honored by it, but that shit is weighty. Alex, Felipe, Fruto, 
everyone who's worked their brains out that we could all gather here, that we could hear all these speakers, that all these people would travel from the ends of the earth to be together, that you would cook scraps and <laughs> ripe fruit and introduce us, open our hearts, our minds. Obrigada, thank you so much. We are honored, we truly, are truly, united. Truly. We have so much to do, you lit the path. Thank you and thank you, Alice.